Hello, Augies. I'm Dave Kassler, amateur radio call sign KE0OG, here with episode 121 of Ask Dave. Our topic for today is soldering, which is joining metal parts together using a low melting point filler material. The filling is called solder, and as you can imagine, the process of joining via solder is called soldering. Well, at least we Americans call it soldering. In the UK, they voice the silent L to create soldering. In either case, soldering works because the filler metal, or solder, melts at a much lower temperature than the pieces being soldered. By the way, that came from Wikipedia. It sounded good, so I put it in there. A little formal. Soldering's putting things together, like kits. All of the devices here on the desk have something to do with soldering. Some are low-end, some are high-end. Some control the heat by controlling the amount of power delivered to the heater, and others have thermostats to keep the tip temperature constant. This first one is technically a desoldering station for surface mount components, but it can also be used as an excellent general purpose temperature controlled soldering station. These are not expensive and stations like this 852D Plus are available on Amazon from many dealers for less than $100. This next device is a high-end HACO vacuum desoldering tool. I'll talk about desoldering in another video. The classic Weller soldering gun is next. Actually, this is too powerful for circuit board work at 125 watts. Great for connectors, though. After that is this simple desoldering braid. Next to that is a spool of 60% tin, 40% lead, 0.032 inch diameter rosin core solder. I also have a spool of the same type of solder, but 0.062 inch diameter solder. It's, it's kind of big. There are some situations in which it's handy to have some extra rosin flux for cleaning the joint to be soldered, such as when soldering surface mount components. I warn you that a very little flux goes a very long ways. This device holds the circuit board being soldered in place to free up both hands. Here is an inexpensive suction desoldering tool, very inexpensive. Next to it is the quintessential beginning soldering iron with heat controlled by limiting the power. And next to it is barely a step up, an iron that is either 20 watts or 40 watts. This set has a place to put the soldering iron where it won't burn anything. The wet sponge is used to clean the iron after each joint is soldered. Or you can use something like this little hackle device that contains metal coils that clean an iron's tip. Let's look at an example of soldering to a circuit board. First, make sure the tip is cleaned of any leftover solder or other junk using the wet sponge or the metal turnings. No, don't try to wrap the sponge around the soldering iron because it's just too hot. Just kind of pull it across like this by turning it back and forth. Also, make sure that the tip is tinned. That is, there's already solder sticking to it. If you have a new soldering tip, you will need to coat it with a little solder. Clean it while hot and repeat this several times until there's a little solder there. Use solder that has rosin core or use separate rosin flux. So place the part in the holes and bend them slightly so they don't fall out when you turn the board over. Put a tiny dab of fresh solder on the iron's tip to help with heat transfer. Touch both the component lead and the circuit board at the same time with the soldering iron. 
touch the rosin core solder to the joint, putting in just enough to wet both joints. Make sure nothing moves while the joint cools. The solder joint should look shiny when done. It should be clear that both parts have been wetted by the liquid solder. If not, reheat and resolder the joint. Sometimes it's easier to solder wires if they've been pre-tinned. To do this, hold the wire still with a clamp and then gently apply a small amount of solder. Make sure it's a small amount or it will no longer go through the hole. If I'm joining two stranded wires, I'll often tin both wires before soldering them to each other. Solder is an alloy, meaning several metals mixed together. There are several kinds of solders. Ordinary solders, like these, are made of a mixture of tin and lead. Two mixes are common, the so-called eutectic solder, which is 63% tin and 37% lead. Eutectic solder has an advantage that both the constituent metals melt at the same temperature in that particular alloy. Oddly though, the more common solder is the 60% tin and 40% lead. The slight difference here is that between the solid and liquid stages, there's a plastic stage. As a joint cools, it goes through a short plastic phase, and if the wires are moved during this time, the joint won't take. So be sure to let the solder cool prior to putting even the slightest stress on the joint. And there are many more types of solder for special purposes, lots. Given the large amount of lead in solder, recycling of electronics has caused major lead-related pollution and dangers to people who deconstruct electronic circuit boards. To solve this, the European Union requires all electronics gear manufacturers to use lead-free solder exclusively. That means in the United States, too, because Manufacturers that sell in Europe also sell in the United States and they're not going to build different products for the two. So you're going to get lead-free lead type uh, circuit boards. You can get lead-free solder. It is readily available, but note that it melts at a higher temperature. The more modern temperature-controlled soldering irons can get hot enough for this type of solder. Note that you can mix and match on a circuit board containing lead-free solder joints. You can do repairs with standard tin lead solder if you want. Given the lead in solder, you should wash your hands before eating. You must heat joined metals enough so that they can be wetted by the solder. If the solder balls up or doesn't stick, then the joint is not hot enough. Getting a joint too hot can destroy components so you should solder quickly or even use a heat sink on the component side. A solder joint that doesn't properly wet both parts of the joint is called a cold joint, as shown in this Wikipedia picture. Note how it balls around the lead and doesn't wet it. Reheating this joint can fix it. Note that solder is not very strong and the joint should not depend on the solder for physical strength. Let's talk about flux. In electronics, we don't see flux much because the flux is inside the solder. Electronics uses rosin flux, which comes from the sap of pine trees. Flux does two things. It helps with surface wetting, allowing the solder to flow onto joints better, and cleans the joint to be soldered. The cleaning that is particularly important is the removal of oxides. The simple flux core solder has just the right amount of flux so you don't get a lot left over. Note that metal oxidation will keep solder from flowing, so a flux cover keeps the metal from oxidizing while hot while waiting for the, the solder to flow over everything. Note that acid core solder uses an acid-based flux 
to make sure joints are clean, such as plumbing joints, but the flux residue is conductive and can cause ongoing corrosion. Be sure not to use that. Use rosin core solder. Use enough solder to solder the joint. Uh, try not more, not less. Regarding different solder sizes, I've used this big size for a long time now, but now I much prefer the finer stuff. It provides more control. I started using it to solder surface mount components and now use it for most everything. There are two basic types of components on circuit boards, through hole components and surface mount components. Through hole components like this resistor have wire leads and they are inserted through holes in the circuit board and then soldered on the other side. These components are very common in ham radio and are far easier to solder than surface mount components. The surface mount components tend to be very small and require different soldering techniques as I'll show in another video. A short story here. In a previous video I said I hated surface mount components. So Augie Michael Lloyd sent me the necessary equipment and taught me how to do it. I guess now that I know how to do it, it's not so really hard after all. As I mentioned earlier, there are two kinds of soldering irons, fixed heat and fixed temperature. Fixed heat are less expensive and can be purchased in different wattages with 20 to 30 watts being the right size for circuit board work. Fixed temperature irons are more expensive and usually the temperature can be varied. With the Chinese manufacturers now in the market, prices have come way down. Often the temperature controlled types have multiple tip types. Fine tips are used for small work on circuit boards and larger tips can hold their heat better and are used for soldering connectors and coax. So the question is, using a fixed temperature iron, what temperature do you use? I've looked everywhere and found a couple recommendations, which of course were wildly different from each other, and even in the amateur radio handbook it's just barely touched on. I've tried various temperatures and have settled on 375 Celsius or 707 degrees Fahrenheit but others may think that's too hot. Let's look inside a soldering iron. This diagram from Hacko, a large manufacturer of higher end irons and desolderers, shows what's in the tip. The copper holds the heat. The chromium coating keeps the copper from oxidizing when it's so warm. The tip is iron. Note for this to work, this iron tip needs to be coated with solder. The coating process is called tinning and is done simply by applying solder several times while the iron is hot and cleaning the element between each application. Now this is a pretty simple soldering gun. The heating element is in here. The black plastic is what you hold. Do not even think of holding the metal parts. The tip goes in here and is held in place with this screw. Now let's take a look at a temperature controlled unit. While it's cold, we disassemble this to show the heating element, which also has a thermometer element. Different tips can be used. There is a distance between the heating element and the tip. So if too much heat is taken from the tip, the temperature can sag. This is why some elements are larger, so they'll hold more heat to keep the temperature from sagging while soldering larger components like connectors. So how to tell if your iron has heated up? Well, melt some solder on it. It probably can get a bit hotter, so you might wait a few more minutes after that. Take care of your soldering iron by keeping the tip tinned, the screw tight, and cleaning the tip after each solder joint. So the basic soldering technique is this. 
Make sure joints are clean, cleanish. It's best to have a good mechanical connection between the leads to be soldered because solder is pretty soft. Apply heat. You can put a bit of solder on the tip to act as a heat transfer agent. When the joint is ready, solder will flow onto both parts being soldered. Use just enough solder. For circuit board work, use small diameter solder to keep from applying too much. It is possible to overfill a solder joint to the point where it overflows onto another joint. Also, watch for solder splashes as these will definitely conduct. I once had a kit project fail because of a stray solder ball that was too small to see without high magnification. I ended up using the point on a very thin sewing needle to dislodge it. So inspect your work carefully. Tinning leads can make it much easier to solder wires or components. Just put a bit of solder on the iron and run the wire through it. Note also that tinning stranded wire keeps it from going everywhere when you solder. You don't need a lot of solder for this, just a very little will do the job. Once tinned, component leads and wires can be much easier to solder. Sometimes you can do what's called tack soldering, which will hold two parts together if the force pulling them apart is not large. Here is an example of tack soldering. The wires from the speaker go down to these pads here. There are no holes. The leads are tack soldered to the pad. Note that you cannot do this with springy wire because the wire will come up while the solder is still hot unless somehow held down. After each joint or group of joints, clean your soldering tip using the small wet sponge or a copper cleaner such as this one. Always start and end with a clean iron. It's a sophisticated tool. Take care of it. In another video, I'll discuss surface mount components. It's not as hard as might seem, but subject of another video. So is desoldering. I have braid, a cheap solder sucker, and an expensive solder sucker, and I'll show them in that video. Let's lastly discuss soldering safety. Soldering involves hot metal surfaces. You can very easily burn yourself, and it happens in an instant. Your natural reflexes can make you let go of things, which can make things even worse. So use a well-lighted area with all necessary tools right at hand. Put something between your eyes and the work you're doing. Glasses at a minimum, better safety glasses, safety goggles, a large magnifying light, something. Remember, bad joints can be unsoldered, but burnt eyes can't be easily fixed, if at all. Note that the smoke or fumes coming from the solder are not lead fumes, but rather the flux burning and boiling away. Still, it's recommended that you not breathe it if you can avoid it. Randy Hall, K7AGE, suggests a small fan to pull fumes out of the way. But note that any significant air movement, such as trying to solder outside, will blow the heat away faster than you can apply it. It's almost impossible to solder outdoors. You will be encountering the need to solder sooner rather than later in your electronics work. It takes practice, and there are learn to solder kits out there. Here's an example kit from sparkfun.com, kit 13708, which includes a simple little electronics kit, as well as a simple set of tools consisting of a soldering iron and holder, safety glasses, solder, desoldering braid, and a pair of diagonal cutters. It also comes with a beginning soldering handbook. The kit is $40 plus tax and shipping, available at the URL shown on the page. I have no ties to SparkFun, but have built some of their kits before. They're located here in Colorado on the other side of the Rockies from me. In fact, I have no connection with the manufacturers or distributors of any of the equipment I've shown today. 
There are myriad kits out there you can try as a beginner or after you gain some practice. Your soldering skills can help you repair devices. You may, like many others have, find that you want to build at least part of your station. Soldering is a foundation skill for amateur radio and for makers, so get your feet wet, but not with solder. In channel news, I'll see you on the Saturday Morse code practice sessions held for a half hour at noon U.S. Eastern Standard Time or Saturday at 1700 UTC. Also, I've obtained some more thumb drives and have made more sets of amateur extra training videos. Be sure to check out dcastler.com support for more details. Oh, and an Augie reminds me to urge everyone to use both feet when walking, which I've forgotten to do recently. Until we next meet, 73. Next week's video will focus on digital mobile radio using the Radioddity GD77S for a review. Tune in.